I'm Shaheen Shan, and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, winners. Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode, it comes from Alexander von der Heyer and says, champions don't show up to get everything they want. They show up to give everything they have. Our guest today is Shaheen Cheyenne, whose life has been about as crazy of a roller coaster as you could imagine. After fearing for their lives during the Iranian revolution of 1970, Shaheen's family fled the country, leaving everything behind, and eventually found a new home in Los Angeles, California, where we are today. At 15 years old, Shaheen left home with nothing but the clothes on his back. A few short years later, he kickstarted the smart drug movement and was at the helm of a business empire that spanned the globe and generated more than $1 billion in revenue. The product, Herbal Ecstasy, a legal, just to clarify, a legal party drug that took the music world by storm and caught the fierce attention of disgruntled drug dealers, big pharma, and of course, federal authorities. Today, he is the founder and CEO of Accelerated Intelligence, which provides supplements, nutrition, and research to support optimal brain health and well-being. He's also a major fulfillment by Amazon seller, the lead coach at Amazon Mastery, where he teaches entrepreneurs how to crush it on the Amazon platform, and is regarded as one of the leading global minds on what's next in e-commerce, Amazon, and the internet. Outside of those ventures, he's the founder of podcast booking agency, Podcast Cola, and host of the Hack and Grow Rich podcast. What hasn't this guy done? In this episode, we're going to talk with Shaheen about how he ushered his startup venture to more than $1 billion in sales, the biggest opportunities to make money today, his secrets on optimal brain function and productivity, and the craziest moments from the nine lives he's lived so far. Before we begin, remember, Remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Shaheen Cheyenne. Shaheen, great to see you, my friend. Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm psyched. You've had an incredible journey. I mean, it feels like you've already lived nine lives and you still, you know, got many, many years left in you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, totally. It, feel, it feels that way, right? But I, I feel like I am in a very good place in my journey. Uh, wasn't always the case. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Beneath everyone's front story, there's always a, there's always a back story. And you, you've had such a, a, a crazy, you know, from, from the earliest ages, you've had such a crazy journey. What was your earliest childhood memory? And how often do you think about that today? Man, my earliest childhood memory was probably in Iran. And I grew up in Tehran. My family, we were immigrants uh, coming to the United States. But when we were in Iran, I remember being a little kid and at five years old, just like being able to walk out into the street, go to the store and buy stuff coming back. Iran's very safe as far as crime goes. So there's kids roam the streets all the time. So I remember doing that and having a little gang and feeling like, man, I'm at top of the heap here. And then shortly thereafter, the Iranian revolution happened. Uh, My parents being Iranian Jews were like, man, we've seen this happen before. We better get out in case something happens. So we moved to the United States as as immigrants, as refugees. And then being in a new country where I didn't speak the language, uh, I didn't understand the culture. And, you know, it was a pretty rough time Mm -hmm. back then. It was Iran-Contra. We weren't exactly the, the favorite people of America. So it was a very difficult transition from like being top of the heap where my family's like solid middle class, you know, being being in a very good place, coming to America where I don't speak the language, we're poor and like kind of looked down upon. So you're an outcast in the land of opportunity. An outcast in the land of opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And then at the age of 15, interesting part of your story, at the age of 15, it sounds like you, you know, you came from a, a great family, not an affluent family, but, you know, uh, yeah, it sounds like you had a lot of love and things in your family. At the age of 15, you, you left home. What was the reasoning behind that decision? And how do you feel about that decision today now that you're a parent? Yeah. So I, I looked around me at that time. So we're talking about the 1980s, uh, early 1990s. And I saw a lot of wealth. We moved into this uh, up and coming part of town that hadn't been gentrified yet. This part called Pacific Palisades. I'm sure you know it. But back then it wasn't all that. And my parents managed to buy a house. They bought it from like some hippie, Hare Krishna, whatever's, and they had to fix it up. And it was a whole story. 
And all around us started popping up all this wealth. The guy next door got a Porsche. There were all, all these big houses popping up, all this wealth. But there was none for me. I kept thinking, what's the path to this? So I asked my folks, I said, hey, I want that. I want the Porsche and the beautiful blonde sitting next to me driving down PC. How do I get that? And they were like, well, we don't know you. Be a doctor. Be a doctor. Doctor is the only way, right? Because for immigrant families, the pinnacle of success is to be a doctor. So they really wanted me to do that. And I looked around and I was like, man, like... Mm -hmm. I, I, I got to go talk to someone who's a doctor. So I went next door and there was a dude and I just remember like walking up. I was like, all right, I'm going to go talk to that dude and see what, what it's like to be a doctor. So I walked in, dude was like, he looked like 60. He was probably like in his forties now in retrospect. And he was fat and bald. The wife was fat and bald. The kids were fat and bald. Everybody was fat and fucking bald. I don't want and, that life. Is that what you're thinking? Right. Yeah. And they were all just grumpy. And I was like, man. And I like talked to him. He's like, I can't talk. And he always had to go. And like, yeah, he had the 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 nice car and the nice house, but his life was fucking hell. He yeah. didn't own his time. So I realized, man, I, I'd rather just go sleep on the beach. I don't want that. So that's literally what I did. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I remember reading Think and Grow Rich as a kid. Mm. It was the first big self-help book, actually, of, of that era. I mean, you didn't really have much choices of stuff to read when you were looking for personal development that was wealth encouraging. Mm -hmm. So I remember I had that book highlighted so many times that I had highlights over highlights. Almost every word in that book was highlighted. And I remember thinking to myself, there's got to be a better way. I'm out. So I just bailed. I knew also that if I had a comfort zone to come back to, that I would probably return. So I had enough knowledge about myself to know that I had to burn my ships. And that's what I did. I cut all ties. And I took off and I just left and I was like, all right, now I'm going to figure it out. Mm. And your first business venture, what was the problem that you wanted to solve? Uh, so my first business venture, as far as doing raves or, uh, are you talking about herbal what, ecstasy? What, yeah. What was your, what was your first thing that you would classify as a business that you were involved in? Man. Okay. So I had a bunch of like really f***ing dead end jobs, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was anywhere from sleeping at, uh, cop copy shops, you know, they used to make Xerox copies mm -hmm. at these like copy shops, something that I have to young explain now. Cause people don't understand what that <laughs> is. You tell them, we used to make copies. They're like, of what? Why didn't you just <laughs> email it. I'm like, no, no, you go to a place and you pay and they take the paper and they make a copy. And they're like, and that's a job. It's crazy. You know, a few years ago when I was living in Boston, they, the, the gas company said to me, you need to fax some document to them. Fax? I'm like, I don't, where am I even going to find a fax? Yeah, it's crazy, right? That is nuts. I remember the first fax spam. Do you remember that? We had the and rolls in my office and I just remember all of a sudden shit started coming out of like get cruise ship trips and like yeah. buy our toner supplies and I was like this is Awesome. Yeah. And the facts are saying, oh, we use the facts because it's more secure. I'm like, that's more secure than just emailing it to me with password with a two factor authentication. Yeah. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. Right. So I had a bunch of jobs, right? Those the jobs possible. And from there, I was like, all right, I realized that you are never going to get rich working for somebody else. So I need to find something to do on my own. And just then I found a mentor and I got involved in the electronic music scene, the rave scene, which was booming at the time. And I started doing raves. So that was really my first business venture was doing raves and underground parties and learning about how that whole thing worked. But as I did those parties and the more and more successful I got at throwing these underground parties, I started realizing that the DJs made no money. Nobody appreciated electronic music, especially guys that play other people's music, which it was at those times. The people throwing the parties, we didn't make any money. So like, who's making the money at these parties? So I started looking around. I'm like, these parties always happen. Somehow people are always doing it. Nobody's making money. Someone's making money. So I looked around and there's guys that were always there. They drove nice cars. They had nice looking girlfriends, nice clothes. And I realized it's the drug dealers. I was like, perfect. That that fits all the criteria that I need. I want to get rich. I want to do it quick. Uh, I have no resources. That'll be ideal. And then I looked back to my youth coming to America, and I realized that I was really bad at crime. <laughs> I had a little uh, miniature crime ring as a child uh, where I would sell gum and like glue and like little bottles of liquor that we that we took from the liquor stores and nudie magazines. Back then you had to get porn from magazines. <laughs> Another 
like <laughs> mind blowing thing, right? So we would sell this stuff. And the problem was we would always fucking get caught. And I had, I had recruited all the kids at the school that didn't belong. All the kids that were, what, what did you say? Uh, uh, misplaced in the land of yeah. opportunity. All the kids. Outcast. Them, outcast, yeah, outcast the land of all the outcasts were working for me. <laughs> but the problem was we would always end up attention. Mm. So now I'm like 15, 16. I'm at these clubs. I see this perfect opportunity. And thank God I thought to myself, dude, like just don't do crime. You are bad at crime, sir. You, <laughs> sir, should not be doing crime. So I was like, all right. But then it hit me. I was like, man. The number one drug at the time was ecstasy, MDMA, and they were out. The supply, which mostly came from, from England and Holland, had completely dried up with the just say no campaigns and all this, and the government was actually trying to stop drugs. So these drug dealers didn't have supply. And I thought to myself, man, if I could come up with a natural version of this, a legal version of this, it could be big. Because I could sell it through the same distribution network, always distribution first, and there would be no penalty for doing so. And you know, they say it's like in marketing, it's like selling to the starving crowd, having a product to sell to a starving crowd. So even though you weren't a drug guy yourself at the time yeah. in terms of consumption, you recognize that there were people out there who were just ravenous. They just had this appetite for something. So if you could give them that solution, that experience in a way that was legal- that was your path to achieving those goals that you had. Yeah, totally. So one of the things I write about in my book that one of my mentors taught me is always look at distribution first. The, the fool's way to sell something is to create a better mousetrap and hope that the world will find its way to your door. It's, nobody cares. The correct way to do it is to find a market, to find the distribution, and then to just give it what it needs. That's how you get rich because now you're just feeding the market what it already wants. And all you have to do is tell a better story. Mm. All you have to do is provide value, provide excellence, and you're good to go. Educating a consumer is really the job of these big corporations with endless capital and public funds and that kind of thing. That is not the job of us mm. as mid-level, high-level entrepreneurs. It's not our job to do that. What our job is, is to make money. And how we do it is by finding distribution, finding a market, like you said, that's hungry and just feed and get what it wants. Yeah. So that distribution channels that you had, the local drug dealers who were, you know, did, did they know it was legal? Yeah. In retrospect, brilliant. So <laughs> I remember thinking, all right, this is an untapped network. Why has nobody sold anything else through these guys? Okay, well, there's a danger element, right? They're, they're probably not the most savory characters. Secondly, uh, you know, people probably don't want to be associated with that kind of illicit network. Wasn't a problem for me. I mean, am I going to go to jail for it? No. So cool. Uh, and, and those were the main two blocks. And three was probably reliability, right? As if you sell into brick and mortar or a retail store, you probably have reliability and credit and whatever. But the more I looked at it, these guys dealt with cash all the time. They had to pay cash under penalty of you know what. And so they, they were mostly on the up and up. So you, you would get pretty much no kind of guys. And so what I did was I went into the clubs and I started recruiting the drug dealers. I said, dude, you got no product to sell. You're probably going to end up in jail. Everybody before you has ended up in jail and you're not making a lot of money right now. Give my stuff a try. Mm. And I was very persuasive. Now, I didn't have any money. I barely had food to eat. I barely had a place to stay. I didn't have any of that stuff. So failure for me was not an option. When I stood in front of that guy who, you know, maybe the guy's killed somebody. Maybe he's definitely done some bad things. Dude has tattoos on his face, right? Which in the 80s meant something totally different than now. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking to myself, like, I should have been scared. I wasn't scared. I was standing there right in front of them. And I was not going to leave until they did what I needed them to do. So it was and more naivete than courage. I think it was a, a, a steadfastness. Yeah. Um, being steadfast in my in my view of the world and creating a mindset that's unshakable. Mm. And I did that partly out of necessity, but partly out of understanding that really failure was not an option. 
Mm. It was not a path that I was on. I was going to do whatever it took. The ultimate secret to succeeding in any venture is you have to be willing to do whatever it takes to get there. And I was, I was there, right? And I was also young. So I didn't have a family. I, I know you and I talked about having kids and, and having a family and lifestyle. So I, I really had nothing to lose. And that's when you're at your strongest, yeah. right? They say, you know, especially in the fighting world, I do uh, mixed martial arts now and I train Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And uh, one of the things when I, I love watching UFC and I love watching Thai fighting and, and a, a lot of different fighting is you never fight a guy who's got nothing to lose because they're the most dangerous guys. And that's who I was in those days. And that's why I succeeded so, so hugely. Uh, so uh, in short, I got all these drug dealers to start selling my product, a legal product. A lot of them became legitimate. They started having, they're like, we don't have to hide anymore. <laughs> so they started legitimizing, legitim they started legitimizing <laughs> their, their businesses by, um, starting booths, starting stalls. A lot of them started storefronts. A lot of them bought franchises and pretty soon it went from a few hundred guys to a few thousand guys. And we were all over the world, uh, Berlin, Russia, uh, Japan. I mean, anywhere you can imagine. Following the music we scene, was that the culture that you? Yeah, so we were following the music scene, but we were following any alternative culture yeah. scene that was out there. I mean, our product was sold in music stores. It was sold in sex shops. It was sold in uh, smoke shops. It was sold in pretty much anywhere where you could find alternative culture happening. And nobody was really servicing those industries. So I went in and I was like, this is freaking awesome. Let's do it. <laughs> And pretty soon brick and mortar came to us. We started selling to Urban Outfitters, to 7-Eleven, to uh, GNC, General Nutrition Center. And before I knew it, uh, somewhere between 18 and 20th birthday, I don't even remember right now, I walked into my office. I had 200 employees. All of Venice was mine. I mean, everybody who could, if you could fog up a mirror in those days, we would hire you. Because <laughs> this was pre-internet. I needed people to answer the phones. We were producing this product, this alternative ecstasy called herbal ecstasy for 25 cents a unit. We were selling it for a minimum of $20 a unit. 95% of our business was cash, 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 green cash. Imagine the margins. Mm. And as quickly as we could produce it, we were selling it. So here I am walking into my business, let's say, you know, just, just before my 20th birthday, somewhere around there, and we break a billion dollars in revenue. The news gets out that we've sold a billion dollars of this product. Huge, huge. I have so many questions from this, <laughs> this whole thing. What's interesting that I'd never thought about is that the dealers, you know, we were talking about the starving crowd being the people that wanted that euphoria, they wanted that experience, the people who were attending the music scene. Also, the dealers, they were a starving crowd as well. So you had two mm. starving crowd elements that were able to feed into a, to create a stronger distribution plan. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we, we uh, at the time really looked at the marketplace. We looked at the vulnerabilities in the marketplace. I looked at, are there other competitors in the marketplace? But primarily looking at what's the market need right now? Mm. They wanted ecstasy. They couldn't get ecstasy. They were out of it. And a lot of stuff going around was fake ecstasy. And we came in and, and really filled that need. And how important was the word ecstasy in the title of the product? You know, it's interesting that you ask that. I think it was very important and I'll tell you why. I feel like when you're in the flow, what uh, Chicks at Mihai wrote about in his book, Flow, when you get into that optimal performance state, and things seem to be going your way, it's no accident. And I really felt that way at that time. I had worked hard. I had lived on top ramen. I had, I had done whatever I needed to do to succeed. And I was in that place where I could not fail. And opportunities came left and right. And finding the name for the product was like nothing. It was like, of course, this is what it is. Right. I'd be on a, on a train, a first class train in Paris and some guy would open up a newspaper and there'd be a picture of me in the background. And then he would take a look and I would sit next to him. Turns out he owned 5,000 retail stores in Paris. And I would sit down with the guy and we'd make a deal before the train arrived at its location. And that was my distributor there. 
Of course, that's my distributor. That kind of stuff happened every day, all the time, because I was in this flow state of things happening very quickly. And you can get in that state. I mean, I teach now through my Amazon Mastery course. I teach my students how to do that. And, and you can do that, but you have to be in the right mindset for it. And that's going to be different for everybody. Mm. That immigrant mentality. I, I was reading something recently. It was talking about the people who grew up in, in the country, maybe um, – you know, second or third generation American or Australian, they're the ones who can be quite lazy and take it for granted. But that immigrant mentality, obviously, and not not every case, was that a big thing for you that you your family had moved here and that you didn't want to waste the opportunity? Or was there some other part of that immigrant mentality that enabled you to have that that drive to, to do what it takes? Yeah. Relentless, man. You look at immigrants from any culture. I have so much respect, so much respect for Koreans, for Persians, for Armenians. Right? And I, I've thought about this a lot. So, okay, so this is really interesting. So I'm a huge fan of history, right? I'm absolutely addicted to history podcasts. I listen to all of the different <laughs> history podcasts and I read up a lot on history. So you look at ancient cultures, ancient civilizations. And this is something right now that's missing from this experiment of America that I think immigrants have and why they're so valuable in this country and every country that they come to. So you look at someone like, okay, take King Tut, right? Fairly minor pharaoh, uh, Tutankhamun. They find this guy, right? This guy's buried in this uh, vault. And the vault has like gold chariots and gold chairs. And then they find the sarcophagus. But it's not one sarcophagus. It's four sarcophaguses, right? And one's made out of solid gold. And the other one's like plated with all the jewels. And And you think, all right. This was hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago that they did this. Why did they do this? Why? I mean, this guy had the run of the place, right? He had everything that he wanted. He had wives. He had food. He had like supplies. He was living in abundance. Why spend time doing that for your for for when you die? Why? Why spend resources on that? Resources were scarce during those times. This is why legacy. It mattered to them. So the Egyptians said, and I I might be butchering this, but that you die twice, right? Once when your body dies, but when you really die is when the last person that remembers your name mentions it. That's it. And that's how they're thinking. They're thinking about legacy. They're thinking about the future. They're thinking thousands of years from now, somebody's going to mention my name. And that's why they build that. And then when you look at the immigrant mentality in the United States coming to all these other places, they're thinking about their ancestors. When I worked with indigenous people, when I worked with native people uh, through, a, through a big part of my life, the thing that I noticed is through their oral traditions, what they like to share is the story of their ancestors. It's the most important thing. Why? Because of legacy. So why is that important? Is because you operate from a different mindset. You operate from a different framework. This guy's worried about what's going to happen 2,000 years from now, how people are going to see him. So how is he going to act today? He's going to do big things. That's so interesting. Rewind exactly what he just said there. Go back to the start of that. That is incredible. On that, this is a question I had for you a bit later, but I feel like now is good timing to, to throw it in. Can you teach resourcefulness and that growth mindset in people who might be sort of 35, 40 years old, who have that sort of woe is me victimhood attitude? Can you can you teach a level of resourcefulness that can make them super successful? Or do some people, are they born with it and others just don't have it? Can't teach hunger. Yeah. You got to be hungry. So you can get there. You can You can find the thing that motivates you. You can find your fascination, but it's like the problem with millennials. Nobody can stands for anything. They don't believe in anything. All, all, all that's there is this constant bombardment of social media, TikTok, swipe right, swipe left. They're dating with swipes. There's very little meaningful human interaction that's real. Not only that, the fact is that the hunger is gone because they know they can always return to a base level of comfort. And the most dangerous thing isn't poverty. The most dangerous thing isn't being broken out on the street. The most dangerous thing is being comfortable enough. Because if you're just comfortable enough, you might not ever rise out of that if you don't know yourself. So the trick is to do things that are uncomfortable. 
to seek discomfort, to take an ice bath to do the hour long sauna to do the and, and please don't do this i'm not a doctor i don't recommend <laughs> this to anybody but you know don't do it without your doctor's advice i guess we could say i don't want anyone like freezing or melting themselves <laughs> but ultimately you've got to find the thing that puts you outside your comfort zone and constantly be seeking that. You have to constantly be walking on the edge and you have to do it intelligently. It doesn't mean make stupid decisions. It doesn't mean do things that are harmful to you or other people, but it means maybe you're uncomfortable public speaking. Go f***ing on a public speaking tour. Maybe you're, maybe you're uncomfortable in social circumstances. Go out there and meet as many people as you want and be rejected a thousand times. Maybe you're uncomfortable with sales. Oh my God, how many millennials are uncomfortable with sales mm. if you tell them go out there and sell oh, like, <laughs> oh it's like no you you have to test your comfort levels and the people who i coach and i mentor who i see are successful ha, are either hungry they're born hungry or they've train themselves to be hungry through discomfort, through challenging situations in their lives, they come out of it. It's not the easy things that make us into who we are. It's the hard things. Mm -hmm. It's the challenges and being able to overcome those challenges in life. Mm -hmm. So true. With the, the business journey that you were talking about before, when did you know it was time to sort of let go of that and move on to the next chapter of your life? You mean like uh, do do something different? Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. Well, uh, I think probably... The time that that happened, and I still haven't passed, moved, moved on, I should say. Because yeah. you bought it, on. you sold and bought it back, didn't you? The yeah, yeah. So, so I own uh, Herbal Ecstasy once again. Uh, there was a period of time where it was sold. And so I, I do own Herbal Ecstasy again. So that is in my possession. But there was a time where it was more work than it was worth. Mm. And I had made my money from it. I had achieved my 15 minutes of fame. I mean, I'd been on all the TV shows. We had, we mentioned two covers of Newsweek, London Observer, LA Times, New York Times, everywhere was talking about it. So I had that moment and I had the money and it just became a pain in the ass as the government started cracking down more and more on natural herbal medicine. And we kind of lost relevance at a certain point, right? The culture started moving away from electronic music culture. Now it's back because everything comes back. And I thought, hey, I want to move on. And I moved on to inventing vaporization, digital vaporization technology, which now you see everybody is is vaping. So Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. How do you feel about vaping? Is a trend now talking about like the dangers and, and all that? Like when I was young, it was things like smoking cigarettes in, in yeah. high school was the big thing. And I, I was told through, um, you know, I got 11 nephews and nieces and all that who are now starting to attend high school. And I was told that vaping has become the, the thing that people are worried about at schools. Yeah. So, okay. I'll start out by saying this. I feel as an entrepreneur or a entrepreneur, if you're somebody who wants to be an entrepreneur and you're not quite there yet, I, and a lot of, I'll get a lot of hate mail about this, but I don't feel that doing any kind of drugs makes you a better entrepreneur. Honestly, and you're talking to somebody who's, I've been in the jungle, I've done ayahuasca with the cannibals and the Amazon, and I've done all of that stuff. Right? I was friends with Terrence McKenna, and I knew Timothy Leary, and I've, I've been in that world. I don't think it makes you a better entrepreneur. Just my personal opinion. There's people that'll argue with me. There's Silicon Valley people that are microdosing and this dosing. I think there's a lot quicker ways to make money and get better at making money than taking any of that stuff. I don't think it improves your life. As far as vaping goes to your to your question, I think that it can be very dangerous. The the technology that I built was digital vaporization. Back in the day, you had no options. You could smoke, uh, and that was pretty much it. Um, so what I came up with was a technology where we would heat up the active element. So whatever it was, the cannabinoids, cannabis, uh, or tobacco or herbs, and you would get the active element, but it wouldn't heat it up enough to burn it. And the technology stemmed from that. And we got that from being the size of a ketchup bottle to smaller to the size of a cigar to finally the size of a cigarette. And that's kind of what you see around now. And that was the basis of the research that it's the smoke specifically that's doing the damage. So if you can stay one rung below that, yeah. then you alleviate 80% or so of problems. Three elements that you worry about is smoke, tar, and carbon monoxide. They're the yeah. three carcinogenic, meaning cancer-causing elements of smoking. Mm -hmm. If you could eliminate those three things, then presumably smoking would be healthier. Mm -hmm. That's what that's that's what science told us at that time. 
So we started building this technology where you could heat up uh, the plant just enough to release what you want, but not enough to burn it. So you're not getting all that other bad stuff. Mm -hmm. That was the foundation of the vape pair, the company that I, that I founded and subsequently went public. Now, I don't think anything belongs in your lungs rather than clean, pure, fresh air. Two things can not occupy the same place at the same time. If you're taking something into your lungs, you may have a problem. Now, the problem with vapes, from what I understand, is that in order to get the active elements out of those plants, they have to convert it to a liquid. Okay, fair enough. So you, you extract it, somehow you get it into a liquid. Now, for that liquid to aerosolize, to look like smoke, you know, to like actually get to steam, they have to mix it with something. And that stuff is not tested. Glycerin, whatever it is they mix that with, that's what the problem is with. So the plant matter, sure, if you're getting a little bit of cannabis, a little bit of THC, I don't know how harmful it is. Again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I can't give anybody health advice, but I suspect for me, that wouldn't be that, that harmful. But what, what may be harmful is what they mix it with to make it more palatable in in the human body and to make it more look like a like a cigarette mm -hmm. right so i i don't think anybody should do it now the problem where things really get get tricky is that it's a much better experience than smoking if you've ever vaped i don't have you ever vaped yeah. before yeah it's a much more play it's just clean it's easy it's friendly they taste like fruit flavors so what ends up happening is what ended up happening when they introduced filter cigarettes and when they introduced uh, menthol cigarettes is that people think it's better for you. So they consume 10 times as much. <laughs> and especially Americans, we can't do anything in moderation, <laughs> right? They're like, weed is legal. All of a sudden there's like people smoking. I'm like, really? Do you need to have like five vapes right now? I know it's legal, but- It's like know, I'll drink six Diet Cokes instead of one Coke. And yeah. yeah, that's what it is. So Americans can't do anything in moderation. Uh, unfortunately, we can't. So I think, you know, that's the problem with vaping. And I don't recommend it. And, you know, I, I would be disappointed if I caught my kids doing it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we got we to gotta look at it as a, as a, as a measure of uh, relative risk. Yeah. You've, you've done a lot of work on, on nootropics, these smart drugs and all of these, these different things. What does your daily routine look like um, to get in your optimal brain function every single day? You know, whether it's sleep or activities or things that you do to, to rest and recharge, as well as any supplements that you might take? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think this might surprise you. So I believe in routines but I also believe in breaking routines. So I, I, I wrote about this in my book as well. So I think it's great to try all that stuff. All that stuff is fun. I, I've met Dave Asprey. I know all the, you know, I was at his Bulletproof Labs. I love all that stuff because it's fun, right? And I've, I've got an ice bath at my house and I've done cryotherapy and I've got an infrared sauna and red lights and all that. And I do that when I feel like it. Ultimately, most days I fast, but not every day. Some days I have a really good high fat breakfast. Most days I eat low carb, but occasionally I'll have a pasta because I think probably the most dangerous thing for, for me personally is to get into the dogma of anything. So I believe in discipline, but I don't believe in dogma. So usually I wake up in the morning. The first and best thing that I do with my kids up is I play with my kid. It's the best thing in the world. I know you're a father and that's the greatest thing ever right? So I do that. I, I stop whatever I'm doing and maybe I'll have a cup of matcha tea. We produce some of the best matcha tea in the world, matcha DNA, if anyone's interested. And I'll have a cup of matcha tea and I'll hang out with my kid and it's whatever he wants to do. If he wants to play with his fishing stuff, he wants to build Legos, whatever he wants to do. Then the next thing I do after the kid's out and the wife's out of the house and everything is I'll see how I feel. And usually I'll do a quick ice bath or a quick swim or both. I could go in the sauna for 30 minutes or so. I do a little bit of red light and while I'm listening to history podcasts. Which I <laughs> love. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, you know, I start my day like that usually. Yeah. And then I'll intermittent fast for most of the day. And then uh, some days, so three days a week, I'll go to uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and I'll train for two hours fasted, which I love. It's something somebody in my class taught me because I was like, I was doing intermittent fasting, but I would never do it when I was training. And then he said, oh yeah, I, uh, he's a keto guy who comes to my, uh, he's like, yeah, I, I train fasted. I'm like, I never thought about that. It sounds really hard because you know, it's, it's 11 o'clock when I go to my class, I'm not out until two, mm. uh, and to be fat, but something happens in the body when you're training 
that all the adrenaline kicks up. You don't even think about food. It's the best time to train is when you're fasted. I didn't even think about this. And then when I'm out of class at two, I'm not even hungry anymore. Mm. So- I feel the same experience if I go surfing in the morning, you know, you can be out there for three hours, you don't think about it. But if you're sitting at home, 10 minutes after, it's like, you know, oh, I feel like I need to eat something. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that interesting? Yeah. Because yeah, we eat, we also eat a lot out of boredom and we also eat a lot out of just being sedentary. Yeah. Kind of makes us think, man, we need more energy. Yeah. That You need more energy because you're not out there working out. But it's it's we it's the opposite effect, right? Mm -hmm. So so we're sedentary. So we're like, man, maybe if I eat, I'll get more energy. But you get more energy by going out there and working out or surfing or doing something like that. So I do that, and then the workday starts. Mm. And the workday, I just GTD. You know, I get things done. I I have a process where I attend to things, and you know, things work out pretty mm -hmm. well for me. And that's that's kind of the kind of the day. A big part of your success has been about spotting trends before they happen, so you can leverage that. What do you? Is there a formula that you have for that? What can people do to identify trends and then figure out what their next move is to um, be part of that? Yeah, there is. So uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Stephen Kotler. He mm -hmm. wrote um, Rise of Superman, Chasing Rise of Fire. Superman, and uh, his his latest one was The Art of Impossible. The Art of the Impossible. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I really enjoyed that book too. Um, and he talks about finding your fascination. So I think there's there's probably like three things that you can do. There's three steps to spotting trends. One is make sure you're in the flow. Right? The most important thing is being in that flow state, having clear space, not having a million things on your calendar, a million things overwhelming you during the day. Overwhelm is the death of flow. So in order to do that, you just need to have blank space. You need to have quiet space, space where you can slow the world down, Take that time and focus on what really matters. That's when you get in the flow state, mm. right? When you're really in the flow. So the first step is being a flow state. The second step, like Kotler talks about, is finding your fascination. Find stuff that you're really interested in, stuff that fascinates you, right? Because you don't know what you stand for until you know what's out there to stand for. So start learning about it. There's so much interesting in the world. There's no, like, there's an endless list of stuff that fascinates me, that I'm interested in. I'm interested in how you're doing this podcast and how you're doing this stuff. I'm interested in cars. I'm interested in kids. I'm interested in all types of different areas of life, of how things work, how development works in in uh, in children. Like I've got uh, my my eight year old boy now who's like developing, and I'm fascinated by how things work in his in his brain and how he builds stuff. And so there's so much stuff to do. So you find your fascination, you're interested, find interest in stuff that has nothing to do with making money, nothing to do with, with business. And I feel like, I think that's two, I mentioned three, but I forget what the third one is. But I think when you're in that state, things come to you. And being able to seize those opportunities, to see those opportunities, and then to seize those opportunities is where it's at. Mm -hmm. And that's and, and when that happens, it's not like, man, what do we name this thing? God, we got in. It's like, of course, it's called ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's called vapor. Of course, like you just know, you just move forward. Things happen so smoothly. Mm -hmm. The person you need to meet is sitting right there next to you, <laughs> right? Things happen in that way. And I don't know how to explain it. I'm a science-based guy. I don't know why things work that way, but I feel like that's the key. It's synchronicity, it's intuition, and it's being in the flow. And I'm sure one day someone's going to figure out how to quantify it and work it out and stuff. But right now I just know what works, yeah. right? Because when you're in that phase, you'll hear that voice that says, go left. Yeah. You're at a crossroads and you hear the voice and it says, go left. And of course you're going to go left and you go left and there's everybody waiting for you going, where the have you been all this time? Yeah. Right. We've been waiting for you. Where have you been? Right. Come on in. Here's all, here's all your money. Here's all your alkalis. Here's all the things that you wanted. For sure. I think when you're in that, that, um, when you have a free open calendar and you're in that flow state, you have an intuition that almost an expectation intuitively that things are going to work out for you. You know, like you said, it's of course, and then that momentum builds on itself. Like the idea of, you know, we mentioned think and grow rich earlier. The opposite yeah. of that, think and grow poor. It's the people who can, you know, I was in that <laughs> space. You might have been in that space at one stage in your life too, where when you're like, um, you're like, oh, this is going to happen in a few minutes. I had big an issues with anxiety because I knew that this was going to happen. And sure enough, when you adopt a completely different mindset and expect good things to happen, then they do. Yeah. To some extent, 
it's whatever you want to make it. Mm. So people always ask me like, oh, how, you know, like, wh- how do I get this? How do I do that? I'm like, it's whatever you want, mm. but you're going to have to work for it. <laughs> like people feel like they don't have to work for it. Like you got to go out there and work for it. And you got to be willing to do whatever it takes. Can you work smarter? Yeah. Can you add efficiencies? Can you optimize? Yeah. How do you do that? You build network. Yeah. And speaking of working smarter, you're doing, you're doing a lot of work with Amazon. And something I heard you mention on another podcast that you were on was talking about how Jeff Bezos, who gets a lot of hate about, what is it, $200 billion or however much <laughs> money he has, but he's actually created thousands and tens of maybe hundreds of thousands of millionaires out there as well on the planet through the platform that he has created. When did Amazon, first of all, uh, first come on your radar? So I started selling on Amazon in the very early days. So I I think it was somewhere around 2010, 2009, Bezos opened up the platform to third-party sellers. And what that meant was before everything was sold by Amazon on Amazon. So if you want to sell that, that book on Amazon, you would sell it to, well, books you were allowed to sell, but outside of books, products, you would sell to Amazon and Amazon would sell it on the platform. So Bezos and his infinite wisdom was like, Hey, let's open up the platform and let third party sellers sell on our platform and we'll charge them a commission. And so we started doing that. And the second I started doing that, I was like, wow. There's something to this. This guy knows what he's doing, and this could be one of the biggest companies in the world. So I put all my eggs in the Amazon basket at that time, and I was like, let's see where this goes. And I learned how to speak the language of Amazon, how to sell on Amazon. And I had several products that were doing multiple millions of dollars on there in a very short period of time. So, And in that time, I've learned how to do it. And one of the things that I do is I teach others how to create a company, create predictable recurring revenue on Amazon, and it could be taught to anybody. You need very little resources, right? If you're like, hey, Shaheen, I want to open up a restaurant, I'd be like, man, you need a few hundred grand and your chances of success are, I don't know what, like 10% and whatever. Low margins, Yeah. yeah. Very little money under 10 grand. You can open up an Amazon business with product and start selling it and very feasibly make a few hundred thousand dollars a month. It happens all the time to people making a few hundred thousand bucks a month, a million bucks a month in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So selling on Amazon is very low risk, very high profit potential. And yeah, like any other business isn't without its problems, but it's, it's the brilliance of what Bezos has created and and love him or hate him. Like you said, you know, that anytime I think you achieve that level of wealth, there'll be problems. And there'll be people that'll that'll hate on the guy. Uh, there'll be people that are jealous. Mm. There'll be people who don't feel that they're worthy of it, so they hate on him. And there'll be people that have legitimate qualms, like they say, hey, maybe the workers aren't getting the right benefits or whatever. But it, it's much like governance, mm. right? Like every everybody's good their first day in office. And then once they start governing, you're like, oh man, well, these people are displaced, but those people are, are, are being uh, unfairly compensated and those people have this. And so, 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 so it creates that kind of an ecosphere. And Amazon is one of those. It's got its bad parts. It's got its good parts, but it doesn't mean that you and me can't get really rich uh, selling on there. Do you, if, if you were working with someone now who was like, look, I just want to make money working from home, what would like what steps would you would you take them through? And are they creating their own products or are they selling someone else's products? Yeah, so um, a little of both. But one of the common things that everybody should know is with with TikTok and Instagram and all these like channels popping up, everybody jumped on the bandwagon of being an Amazon guru. Everybody's like, drop ship. All you got to do is find a product that's sold on Amazon for $20 and you buy it for one and then you get that person to ship and you're making millions. Problem is they're teaching that to 10,000 other people and 10 other guys are teaching that to 10,000 other people and it doesn't work. And- what it works for is these guys selling their courses. We don't teach that. I te- if, if someone's interested in that, it's not what I teach because it doesn't work. Well, what I teach is sustained recurring predictable revenue streams by creating excellent products. So what I teach people to do is go out there and find a vulnerability in the market. Find a market that you, like you said, is starving for something. And now we're going to go to China. 
We're going to have them produce that product for us. We're going to brand it. We're going to tell a better story. We're going to create added value to the product. Maybe our battery lasts longer. Maybe our quality is going to be better. Maybe our packaging is better. Maybe we include something extra in there. Maybe you have some information that other people don't, so you can have better information that goes along with your product. And then we're going to use these algorithms, these systems that I've built over the course of the last 10 years selling on Amazon, 10 plus years selling on Amazon. And we're going to use that to create recurring revenue. And you're not going to get rich overnight. It's going to take time. And you might fail once, you might fail twice, but eventually you will succeed. I've got a hundred percent success rate with the people that have followed my system to do this. And then what happens is you create a business and guess what? You're going to have to work at it, but you get to create a, a system of revenue, a form of revenue where you don't have to go into a job, where you don't have to answer to anyone else, where most importantly, you don't have to sell your hours for money and you create these predictable revenue streams. And maybe this is one of many. Mm -hmm. Maybe you do this. Maybe you start buying some stocks. Maybe you start investing in real estate and you start creating this really nice financial plan and outlook for yourself so that you just can't have a bad day. Mm -hmm. You come in and the stock market's down. That's cool. You got your real estate business. Real estate business down? Well, Amazon always seems to be doing well. Mm -hmm. So you've got this well-rounded foundational type of thinking. And that's really what I teach. Those are the people that I want to encourage to succeed or the people who want this kind of foundational thinking and are looking to get rich slowly. Yeah, it's a refreshing change to the get rich quick schemes that you just get hammered with on, on TikTok and Instagram. And is that why now on Amazon there seems to be the emergence of more of these like not established brands? It's like these products that rate really well and appear in the first page of the search results on Amazon, but are from brands that you've never even never even heard of. Is that is that what they're they're doing? They're creating new brands, like whether it's bed sheets or whatever it might be. It's like, how did this thing that I've never even heard of is like the number one um, ranking on the on the Amazon search results. Yeah, a lot of those are our students. So mm -hmm. Amazon is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? Back in the day, we had what Seth Godin calls disruption marketing. Right? You're watching the Super Bowl. Knock knock, buddy. You want a you want a beer? Like, no, I'm good. Knock knock. You want a beer? You want a beer? Do you want a beer? That was how they marketed. Effectively, that's it. They just interrupt every few seconds, pound it into your head until you buy it. And it costs millions and millions of dollars. And we're not sure how great it worked. What happened is that things changed and permission marketing came in. Now, how does that play into Amazon? Well, Amazon fed off that momentum. They created this amazing platform right about the time where the internet and e-commerce was at its height. And Amazon said, disruption marketing doesn't matter here. Sure, you've got the big brands that always sell Tide, will always sell Tide pods, right? People will always buy that. But if you've got a laundry detergent that's 20% cheaper, that looks cooler, that tells the story better, on Amazon, if you know the right algorithms and systems, you can compete with that Fortune 50, Fortune 500 company and do really freaking well and take up a big piece of their market share. And that's exactly why a lot of these big CPG, consumer product goods companies are rolling up Amazon firms. Mm -hmm. Because what they realize is that companies started by people just like my students have gone in and taken a big chunk of their market share mm. because they now realize that they can compete with these companies. If before you wanted to compete with a company like Tide or a company like, like Coca-Cola, you would have no hope, zero chance that you would make any impact in the marketplace. You just wouldn't be able to. Getting distribution is an old boys club. You'd have to know people. You'd have to have millions and millions of dollars to do that. But on Amazon, you don't. You need 10 grand and... Uh, the momentum to get out there and just, just some good ideas and somebody to coach you and you can start that company and you can compete with those brands. And what we've seen happen is a lot of these companies are being bought out for seven figures, eight figures, a few of them for nine figures mm -hmm. where they came out of nowhere. And in two years, three years created these companies on Amazon, these brands on Amazon, like you said, that no one's ever heard of before mm -hmm. and sold. And now those brands are owned by these big Fortune 50, Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. I know you're a fan of uh, Influence by Dr. Robert Caldini, one of my favorite all-time books. Uh, what are the biggest business or marketing lessons that you have learned from this journey that you've been on? Yeah. So I think 
first and foremost is what we talked about is that you want to sell to a starving audience, right? So always start distribution first, one of the key things. And I talk about this again in my book, Billion, How I Became King of the Throat Pull Cult. Uh, the second thing is, like we were talking about, just to recap, is that being in a flow state is one of the key elements. So being able to get yourself in that flow state should be priority for any entrepreneur. Because you think clear, when you think clear, you're in a better, better place, right? Like we know, don't drive when you're tired, don't fight when you're tired. Don't make any huge life decisions when you're exhausted. Similarly, you should make those decisions when you're in that flow state. And knowing how to turn that on and off is critical. The other thing is, it's so important to find somebody who is where you want to be and utilize their mistakes, their lessons, which is why I talk about mentorship, which is why I teach an Amazon course. Uh, which, by the way, for anybody watching this, I'm happy to give them my one hour course for free. So we can we can share that with yeah. everybody in the show notes or whatever. People can reach out to me. Amazing. Thank you. We will absolutely um, put that in the in the show notes. Yeah. So you don't you don't you don't you don't you actually don't need any money to start. So and I can show people how to do that. But um, ultimately, I think those would probably be two really good takeaways. And the final thing is know yourself. Right, the Temple of Delphi, they had a few things inscribed on the on the walls, and one of them was know yourself. You gotta know your strengths, but equally as important, you gotta know your weaknesses. You gotta know if you've got a bag of cookies in the jar right in front of you, you're probably gonna be eating cookies. So don't have that jar of cookies in front of you. Similarly, you need to set your world up to be a decision architect. So that at the end of the day, you win, you know, you know, you're a dad, right? We've got kids and the trick to kids isn't pounding it into their heads. Like you got to do this. You got to become a doctor. You got to do that. The trick is to tricking them into doing what's best for them. You become until they're of age, until they're 18, a decision architect where you are building an ecosystem where somehow they're just making the right decisions and winning and going, dad, look at this great decision I made. I won. And you're like, yeah, that's interesting. But it's because I put you around the right people. I put you around the right environments. The right books just seem to show up in the house. You saw me leading by example, uh, uh, working with integrity, uh, teaching with integrity. You know, you saw me doing all this stuff. So yeah, you made the right decisions, but you were the decision architect. So similarly in your own life, you want to become the decision architect. Yeah, I love that. Uh, do you, th you know, the movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper was a very sure. popular movie. Do you think a drug, something like that, a pill that people can take that would massively upgrade their mind without a lot of side effects, which is unfortunately what happens in the movie, he has all the side effects. Yeah. Is that the type of thing that we would see in the next sort of five, 10, 20 years? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I think the way that the, the human brain works is that it's it's a marathon and not a sprint. And anything that it adds now, you will have to be forced to take away later. There's a price to pay. Yeah. There's a price to pay. But ultimately, I think, look, there's there's amazing technology out there. And I think technology is constantly improving. Medicine is improving exponentially. There's going to be amazing things out there. But I don't think you would want some... I mean, it, ideally, yeah, okay, we would all like a pill to get younger. We would all like a pill to get smarter. But you know, eating right, mm. exercising clean food, clean living, clean air, right? Good connections with people, a lot of familial connections, good friends, time with family and friends. Like these things aren't sexy. Yeah. You can't sell a book about that stuff, <laughs> right? There's no book in that, right? That's yeah. why diet books, I was like, try this diet and that diet and the fish diet and the only meat diet and all these things because you, you, can, you, can, you can sell that stuff. And they're talking about what they're selling, right? Yeah. yeah. And sell yeah. products behind it. But the yeah. fact is you might do great on eating a little bit of meat and then maybe being vegetarian once a week. Mm -hmm. You might do great uh, doing a certain kind of workout, another workout, another day. And something that might work for you today might not work for you tomorrow. There's no book in that. There's no product to sell in that. And that's what people don't want to tell you. And that's why so the most important thing is having discipline, but being able to break dogma and doing it without breaking the bank and, you know, just, just being stupid. Yeah. The prescription without asking questions, I feel like, is just too big right now. Everyone's like, you need to do this, you need to do this. It's like, how about we first ask questions about what this person wants, what their unique strengths and weaknesses and everything else is. Um, final question before we move into the rocket round. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you would write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day? 
I love change. Mm. I love it. All right, let's now move into the win the day rocket round. 10 questions for some quick responses. Are you up for this one? Let's do it. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Know yourself. Know thyself, I guess. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Morning coffee. Or is it morning matcha? Morning matcha. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Seek mentorship. Number four, what book do you gift the most? My own book, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. I love it. What, uh, if you had to pick another book or one book that's had the biggest impact on your life, what would it be? Uh, I'd probably go Getting Things Done, David Allen. Yeah. Uh, number five, was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? A vulnerability that I... Okay, so I got to think about these. These aren't lightning round <laughs> questions. A vulnerability... Yeah, you once hid within that became your superpower. Kindness. Mm. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Generally speaking, it's not permanent. <laughs> <laughs> Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Right, I saw that. Um, I At the moment, I'm going to go with Justinian. Mm -hmm. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Tool or resource. I think outsourcing... Uh, I think I, I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to rewind that. I'm going to say yeah. podcasting, actually. Mm -hmm. I think uh, doing other people's podcasts is one of the most powerful things. Mm, absolutely. Episode 100 of this show, actually, Brandon was in here. He was sitting where you are. Yeah. He interviewed me on the show where I spoke about just the power of podcasting and how that can change your life. It's huge. I mean, getting access to amazing networks and everything else, it's a, it's a hugely beneficial um, venture to be involved in. Uh, number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Is there anything left that you haven't done at this point? Yeah, I want to go to Ethiopia. I haven't been to Ethiopia yet, and I love Ethiopian food. I love their culture, but it's a part of the world that I'm, I'm fascinated by, so yeah. really would like to go there. Is that as a result of the history podcast you've been listening to? Partially, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and final question, number 10, what's one thing you do to win the day? One thing I'm going to do to win the day today, yeah. Um, outside of this podcast, it's an awesome podcast. One thing I'm going to do to win the day is to make a sale. Yeah. What What do you? <laughs> is there anything on your mind when you wake up, or that's an essential part of your daily routine that you just have to do no matter what? Yeah, being with my kid. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. It just changes everything, doesn't it? Changes everything. Yeah, yeah. Makes it's decision. the best thing in the world. But yeah. you, these things aren't sexy. These things don't sell books, right? People want <laughs> want you to take this pill, do this biohack, you know, like this crazy thing. And all that stuff's fun. Yeah, do it all. Try it all. It's all great. But the really basic is free. The really great stuff, you don't need to read a book. Yeah. You know how to cuddle with your kids. Mm -hmm. Right? You know how to go out there on a walk and just let the sun beat down on your face and be like, man, that feels good. Yeah. You know how to do all that. You don't need a book. You don't need a product for it. And the lessons that um, you can learn just from watching your kids interact with the world and grow teaches you so much about yourself and, and life, doesn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You get to be a kid all over again. Yeah. And it's absolutely remarkable. For sure. Yeah. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Shaheen, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Hack and Grow Rich. Grab a copy of his awesome book, a Billion, on Amazon, and visit his website, shaheenshayan.com. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Thank you, my friend, for coming on the show today. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate you having me. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win the Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what actions you'll be taking as a result result of what was shared in this episode. And if you found value in the Win The Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win The Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.